Uh, thanks to Tori and Adrian for that. You know, as we're approaching Valentine's Day on Tuesday, we thought we would kind of take a break in our series and talk a little bit about what Jesus has to say about love and marriage and also divorce. Now, anytime we talk about subject of divorce some, obviously it's a very uh, painful subject for a lot of people. The pain is very real. Those of you that have been through it and been touched by it. And I just want you to know as we approach this subject of love, marriage, and divorce, and we talk a little bit about divorce, that I want you to understand that I have no desire to add to anyone's pain this morning. This is going to be a message that is going to be helpful and healing. For those who have been through a divorce, it's going to be very helpful for those who want to strengthen their marriage. One thing I want to get up front about is Malachi chapter 2, verse 16. God says this. He says, I hate divorce. This is what God says. I hate divorce. He hates divorce. He does not hate divorced people. Amen. He hates divorce because he hates it when people get hurt and betrayed and violated and used and then discarded. He hates it when children are left fatherless, when children are left motherless. He hates it when people who were once tender and caring in a relationship begin to treat each other treacherously with bitterness and hostility. He hates all of that. So God hates the anguish and the heartbreak, the betrayal of divorce. He hates it. But he loves you. He loves you, he loves me, he loves all people, including divorced people. So as we talk about what Jesus has to say about love, marriage, and divorce, I want to tell you I've gotten a few hopes about what I want to see happen here in the next 25 minutes. First of all, for those of you that are headed for marriage, my hope and prayer is that by the end of this message, you will walk out of here today with a deep resolve of how to build a marriage once you have one, and how to not allow for divorce to even be an option. I also have a hope and prayer for some of you this morning who've already been through the agony of divorce. My prayer is that this would not be a time of judgment or pain for you. This would be a time of healing as we walk through what Jesus has to say. That you would leave here with a sense of forgiveness and freedom, but also a sense that God has good plans for your life. For the rest of your life, our God is good and he has good plans for your life. And finally, I have some hopes and prayers to those of you that are married, that this next 25 minutes you'll walk out of here at the end of that time with a sense of some real tools where you can strengthen your marriage to where it can be healthy, even more healthy, and, and flourishing. Well, let's look at a passage where Jesus speaks about the subject. Matthew chapter 19 Verses 3 through 9. Here's what Jesus says. Matthew 19, 3. And some Pharisees came to him, testing him, testing Jesus, and saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Consequently, they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate and divorce her. He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. So Jesus is asked a question 
about a subject that was very controversial in those days and is very controversial today. He's asked a question by the scribes and Pharisees, and here's how he answers it in three parts. First of all, the first thing he does is he emphasizes the sanctity of marriage. He points out that marriage is not just a civil contract. That if one person isn't doing their part, the other person can get out of it. But rather, a marriage, according to Christ, is when a man and a woman become one flesh. And he goes on to say, what God has joined together, let no man separate. So according to Jesus, marriage is a divine institution by which God makes permanently one, a man and a woman, who decisively and publicly leave their parents in order to form this new unit and the two become one flesh. Now, you might jump in there and agree with the scribes and Pharisees' question and say, okay then, but if God feels that way about it, then why did Moses allow for divorce to even take place? And Jesus answers that question by saying, because of the hardness of their, hardness of their hearts, God made a concession, as it were. He did not nullify his original intent regarding marriage. No, he introduces, God introduces a legislation to bring some controls to a situation that had become so chaotic and totally unlivable. Men just putting their wives out in the street back in those days with no proof that they weren't guilty of adultery, no certificate of divorce. It was chaos. And so in the days of Moses, in order to bring some order to the chaos, the, God commanded not that they divorce, but God commanded they write a certificate of divorce if there was a divorce. That would protect a woman. That would bring some order to the chaos. So that's the first thing Jesus points out. Is he emphasizes the sanctity of marriage. The second thing he points out is that God has never anywhere commanded anybody to divorce. See, the Pharisees were suggesting that according to Moses' law in the Old Testament, that there are certain times that a man is commanded to divorce his wife. And Jesus points out that's never been the case. God's never commanded anyone under any circumstance to divorce. What he did command is that if there was a divorce, that there is a certificate of divorce. Again, it would protect the woman and bring some order to the chaos that was going on. Also, it's good to keep in mind here this whole idea that, that we're all sinners in need of mercy and forgiveness. And we must all be ready to extend that same mercy and forgiveness that we've received onto others, including our mates. All right, here's the third thing that Jesus points out is that there's only one legitimate cause for divorce. Immorality. This is what Jesus says. There's only one legitimate cause for divorce, and that is immorality or adultery. See, according to our Lord, nothing can dissolve this one flesh bond except that one of them goes and becomes one flesh with somebody else, committing adultery, and therefore doing that, they broke the bond. Again, let me emphasize that there's not a command to divorce if that bond is broken. But it's a ground for divorce. But Jesus is saying, if you divorce for any other reason, while that one flesh bond is still intact, and then you go and marry someone else, and that one bond is still intact, then you actually commit adultery. And even if that's the case, the overall teaching of the Bible is that there would be restoration, there would be forgiveness, reconciliation. But Jesus says, but because of the hardness of your hearts, there's a concession made. Because so many people will not repent because of the hardness of their heart from what they've done. And so many people will not forgive the other person, the spouse, for what they did. So because of the hardness of your hearts, he allows 
He allowed for divorce. And that one situation, that one condition of adultery. Again, even after we hear all that, we've got to remember the whole context of the Bible is a message of reconciliation. One of the early church fathers, Christostom, he linked this passage with the passage in the Beatitudes that Jesus summarizes what he says in Matthew 19 and Matthew 5. And he connects it to the Beatitudes and Christostom says, For he that is meek, and a peacemaker, and poor in spirit, and merciful, how shall he cast out his wife? He that is used to reconcile others, how shall he be at variance with her that is his own? So that's the backdrop of what Jesus teaches on marriage and divorce. Now with that backdrop, I want to go ahead and speak a little bit to those of you who've been through a divorce and how to move forward with healing in your life, whether your divorce was last week or decades ago. How can you really move forward with healing? Well, there's three steps you must take, no matter how long ago it happened. The first step is repent. Repent. You know, we have an ironic phrase in our legal system called a, called a no-fault divorce. Do you know how many no-fault divorces there are? I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any no-fault marriages. So you might think, yeah, but you don't know what my spouse did to me. I'd say, yeah, but it's very likely that you still contributed to the death of the marriage. Even though they may have done the, the, you know, the worst, you still probably, likely contributed to the death of that marriage. Maybe because you distanced yourself, maybe because of neglect, maybe because of some type of of response that you gave at a certain time or some attitude, you distance yourself or some fear, but somehow you got to look at your life and say, okay, Lord, show me what I did I need to repent from and get that, just get that before God and walk and get it under the blood of Christ. Because if you don't, what happens is people tend to just skip from that relationship and jump into another relationship kind of for pain avoidance. And all they do is take all that baggage with them and how, how can I prove to you that that happens most of the time? Gary Richmond cites some research that he did with many different second marriages, and he discovered that second marriages actually face less than a 30% chance of survival for five years or more. And then he goes on to say third marriages face even longer odds. Why? Because so many did not they carry that baggage. They never really repented from what they did so they could have cleansing and not carry that baggage with them. Freedom, liberty to move forward. So everyone who's been through a divorce, you need to, in all honesty, you face the pain of self-examination. And I know it's painful. Face the pain of self-examination openly and courageously because if you don't, there's a good chance that you're not going to gain from your experience and learn from it and you're going to carry it into another situation and suffer more. And so start with repent. If you've been through a divorce, make sure you've covered number one, repent. Number two, reconcile. Reconcile. God is a God of reconciliation. So pursue reconciliation at its highest possibility. Now, for some of you, that means getting back together with your spouse. I'm not saying getting back together like it was, because the way it was is why you broke up but getting it back together God's way with some help and seeing if you can't bring the couple back, the couple can come together and the family can come back together. That would be, for some of you, the highest possibility of reconciliation. But for most of you, that's not even a possibility. You're remarried or your, your ex is remarried and, or you're both remarried and you can't, you couldn't bring it back together. But what you can do is you can for, still forgive. Amen. You can still forgive them for what they did. Release them from your desire to see them hurt. Somehow pay for it. Let them go. Give them to God. That's the only way for you to get out of the prison you're in. Unforgiveness is a prison we build ourselves. Dr. Judith Wallerstein did some landmark research in the area of divorce, and she writes this. Incredibly, one half of the women 
And one third of the men are still intensely angry at their former spouses despite the passage of 10 years. Because their feelings have not changed, anger has become an ongoing and sometimes dominant presence in their children's lives as well. See, it may take some time. Some of you are thinking, and I've heard it so many times, you, Gary, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they did. And here's the deal. You've got to, you've got to release them for your own good. Amen. Forgive them, release them. And, some, and sometimes you're going to do that and those pockets of resentment are going to come rise to the surface and you're going to have to do it again and again and again till one day you're going to be free. <clears throat> Repent. Reconcile. Make sure you've forgiven. And thirdly, for those of you who have walked through the agony of divorce, rebuild. Rebuild your life around God. Divorce can affect your spiritual life. It can either drive you to your knees or drive you to despair. Now again, I want to remind you, God hates divorce, but he loves divorced people. He loves all people. He loves all of us. And all of us have sinned amazing number of sins that God has forgiven because of the cross of Christ. So no matter what you've done, understand this. There's no one in this room that's so good the cross is unnecessary for you. And there's no one in this room who is so bad that the cross is insufficient for you. Amen. So rebuild your relationship with God. Just receive his forgiveness, rebuild your relationship, and walk in his next chapter for your life. And it is good. God is good. He has good plans for you, no matter what you've been through. Embrace that. Finally, I want to address one more situation. For those of you who are married, how can you build your marriage and avoid a marriage that becomes shipwrecked? How can you avoid the death of a marriage? There was some, a study done by a psychologist by the name of John Gottland, and he, did, he had a whole research team that did this. And I've, I've referred to this study before from this pulpit because I think it is so insightful because all of their conclusions really were biblical. They had a team together, and they came up with four variables that if a marriage had all four of these variables wrong, they could predict a, a, up to 90% accuracy that that marriage was going to fail. These four variables. And they went on to say, if you got these four variables right, then they could predict with 90% accuracy that your marriage would flourish. So these four variables, I think, are important for us to know. I'm going to call these four, uh, you know, marriage, I'm going to call these four negative ones marriage busters, and I'm going to talk about the marriage builder that is in diametric opposition to the marriage buster. So here's the four, starting with marriage busters. Number one, the first marriage buster is contempt. Contempt. When couples treat each other with contempt, that marriage is headed for serious trouble. Contempt is an expression of just devaluing the other person. It can be seen in the rolling of the eyes that you just, that person, you're, it just irritates you. It can be seen in the tone of voice. It can be seen, it, it can be noticed in a look that you give one another if you're treating each other with contempt. You just look at each other like, you are primarily an irritant to me. It involves verbal put downs, constant infliction of pain. That's contempt. Now, the opposite of that, the marriage builder, is honor. Treating one another with honor, not contempt. Romans 12.10, love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. I love that, that translation. Outdo one another in showing honor. Others, make it a contest. See who can outdo the other by showing your spouse honor. Looking for ways to show your appreciation. Noticing things and honoring them with the things you say and the things you do. Second variable. 
Marriage buster number two is criticism. A chronic spirit of negative criticism. It's prominent in your marriage and in your life when you, when you have a disagreement, rather than just going into problem-solving mode with the problem, you take that as an opportunity to point out character flaws in your spouse. In other words, you magnify, you frequently comment on their negative traits. Instead of focusing on fixing the problem, you criticize them. It comes out something like this. Would you mind getting off your self-centered, lazy backside and stop watching TV for just a moment, a moment long enough to help your fatherless son do his homework? See, that's not a good way to talk to each other. That's where criticism has just got the upper hand. It's attack. The person, not the problem. Now, the counterpart for criticism is encouragement. That's the marriage builder. Constantly encouraging one another, as Hebrews 3.13 says, day after day. Looking for opportunities to just, just encourage them about you know, things that they've done and when they're using their gift and their strength and when you see them serving and just constantly encouraging them and, and thanking them for this and that and constantly in the st grandstands for them, cheering them on. Third variable, marriage buster number three is defensiveness. That is, when there's a problem, there's a difficulty, you're quick to get defensive right away. And it always seems to be your spouse's fault. Now, the opposite of defensiveness, the marriage builder, is a spirit of oneness. I thought about James chapter 1, verse 19, a great, a great marriage verse, James 1, 19. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Great marriage verse. Think what would happen if all the marriages just in Grace Community Church just applied that one verse for the rest of our marriage. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. All right, fourth marriage buster, and this is a big one. I think this is the biggest of all. Fourth marriage buster, number four, is withdrawal. Just, with, just choosing to withdraw. Maybe you haven't left the house, but emotionally, you've withdrawn. Author John Ortberg says this. He says, fighting and anger in themselves are not, you know, predictors of divorce. They're not. They take place in distress and troubled marriages. They take place in healthy and flourishing marriages. It's not the fighting and the anger. It's when you get to the place where you choose to withdraw. You know, most, most marriages end with a whimper, not a bang. People just check out. They just check out emotionally. They, they just they drift out of intimacy. They stop talking. They start getting their emotional needs met somewhere else, maybe by someone else. And they just grow increasingly detached from their spouse. I mean, if that's, if that's where your marriage is right now, I hope there's like red lights blinking, alarm is sounding. This is urgent. This is an emergency. You better do something quick. Now, the counterpart, the opposite, the marriage builder here would be a spirit of connectedness. Tracy and I use that phrase in our marriage. You know, we're in our 42nd year of marriage, and we, we, we've used that since our first year of marriage, you know, this whole idea of, do we feel, are you feeling connected? Do you feel disconnected? We use that terminology a lot because connectedness is biblical. We're supposed to be one flesh. It's more than just some positional truth. There's a reality there I need, we need to walk in. Now, the marriage builder here, really the spirit of connectedness, verses 12, Romans 12, 6 says, live in harmony with each other. What we found out in our relationship, there's three things that keep us connected. And anytime we feel disconnected, we find out the way to get reconnected is those three things again. Here's those three things that help us with our connectedness. Number one, keep courting, keep dating, keep having fun. Keep courting, number one. Number two, watch the pace of your life. 
Sometimes no one's doing really anything wrong. You're just so busy going different directions that you just drifted apart. Watch the pace of your life. You know, every Sunday evening, we get our schedules out to talk about our week. What's your week look like? Well, here's my week. Because we were really are conscious about watching our pace. It's really easy for us to get too busy for each other. And we don't want that to happen. We are committed to not letting that happen. One of the things that we said before, you know, if Grace Community Church ever got together and decided to vote us out, which we don't even have a church government that works that way, but <laughs> if that was ever happened, it'd be okay because Tracy and I would still vote for each other. <laughs> so keep courting. Number two, watch the pace of your life. Number three, resolve conflict quickly and completely. Don't store up grievances. Be quick to forgive each other. And watch out for this. Watch out for the ammunition dump. What I mean by that is you get in a fight and you've got an ammunition dump of all the past grievances that you've never forgiven. So as soon as the fight starts, you're ready. You're in position. You reach back. Oh, yeah? Well, you never. And you always. You're reaching into the ammunition dump of the things you're supposed to have already forgiven. Forgive each other quickly. Resolve conflict quickly. No, no reservoir of resentment. Drain it. How do you drain it? I tell you, the only way to drain it is to forgive each other. Totally. Totally release each other of all the past hurts. Totally forgive them. Totally forgive her. You know, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned before the way I do marriage counseling is sometimes... I, I have a, a, married, a married couple sitting in front of my desk in chairs, and I bring another chair and put it between them. And they look at me like, why am I doing that? I said, I want you to understand something. Here's what Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says. It says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Neither give place to the devil. Unresolved anger and bitterness and unforgiveness gives a place to the devil. The word devil means one who separates. So I tell that couple, I say, right now, the devil's sitting between you, the one who separates. I can't help you until we get him out. If we don't get him out, then I can tell you 10,000 things about your marriage, and none of it's going to help because the one who separates is in there, and you gave him the chair. How did you give him the chair? By not forgiving. So if, and you can't pray him out. You can't rebuke him out. The only way you can get him out is to forgive each other. Because that's the way, because you gave him a place. So you can take the place away by forgiving. Forgiving each other. And some, there, there's some couples here in this room, there's some couples probably online right now, that the best thing you could do all day, way more important than the Super Bowl, <laughs> is sit down with each other hand in hand and forgive each other for everything that's on your mind. Simply say, will you forgive me for and the other person says, I forgive you. And then the other person says, well, you forgive me for. And the other person says, I forgive you. Until you can't think of anything. And you don't point out what the other person is supposed to be asking for forgiveness for. <laughs> you don't help them. You do yours. And they do theirs. And I've seen it so many times. All of a sudden, some tears start coming down cheeks. And the grace of God comes down. But God gives grace to the humble. That was a humbling thing that I just did. And the devil's gone. So now we can build a marriage. You got to get him out. Got to get him out. Let's stand for prayer. Let me invite you to close your eyes and just bow your head for a moment. Father, you know everything that's going on in every life in this room, every life online right now. You know it all. We don't have to explain it to you. You know it all. You know it better than we know it. Lord, I want to pray for those who are headed for marriage. Maybe they're single now, don't even have a prospect yet. Lord, I pray for all of those headed for marriage that they, there be a deep sense of the kinds of things they need to carry into that marriage to build it, and also they carry into that marriage. Whenever it happens, a resolve to not let divorce be an option. That this is a covenant, not a contract. Secondly, Lord, I pray for those who have gone through divorce here, Lord, that that they'd be able to walk out of here with just the tools for healing. They could walk out, Lord, with liberty and not in a prison for, with their own unforgiveness. And that they would walk under 
Lord, the hand of a good God who has good plans for him. And Lord, I pray also for those who are married here. I pray, Lord, that you, their marriage would be strengthened today. They would keep courting. They would watch the pace of their life. They resolve conflict quickly and completely. And I pray, Lord, that they would forgive each other, that there would be no unforgiveness in any of our marriages, that we would empty the ammunition dump, we would drain the reservoir of resentment, we'd walk in freedom with a new beginning today. I pray all this in Jesus' name.